reverence to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, I bow down and go for refuge to the feet of the excellent Holy Lama Yeshe Jimpa, who has great compassion. May the words I speak reflect this compassion and my intention to be a source of help and liberation to all sentient beings. Thank you so much for being here on a rainy day. Uh, my initial thought was to um, talk about uh, sensory awareness practice, which um, has been a very meaningful practice to me in coming into my Buddhist practice. In developing the talk, I realized that um, kind of was turning into a bit of a way seeking mind talk, which is a, a Zen type of talk where a new student um, describes uh, how they came to Buddhism, the, the search that led them to the, to the teachings. Uh, so it'll be a little bit of that, and I'm hoping we have time to actually do a sensory awareness practice. And speaking with Lama Jimpa about this talk, he did want me to like, be very clear that sensory awareness is not a Buddhist practice. It is not a traditional Buddhist practice. It is a Western practice. It comes from Germany in the late 1800s. Um, and so we don't want to create like a mishmash where everything is the same and everything there are actually um, the Tibetans have worked very hard in uh, clarifying uh, teachings of the Indian masters. And so we want to make sure that we can differentiate uh, different practices and how those things work uh, in order to help ourselves and each other so that things are clear. Uh, at the same time, I have found this practice extremely helpful, and I think you'll understand why, to me, sometimes it's, it's just very interrelated with Buddhism because of um, how it came to be in this place. Uh, so I'm a vet, and I left service in 2003, and that was a really hard transition from me, for me. I really enjoyed being a, a soldier and the lifestyle, the camaraderie. And so coming back into the civilian world, I found a lot of dissatisfaction. And um, the only tools that I had at that time were really to um, attach myself to primarily to substances at that time. And so in 2006, I realized that that was not working for me. Um, I had, you know, before that, like gone to college a little bit and like studied and I knew that I was like interested in Eastern religions. And um, so I was looking at those as a source of some sort of relief for the suffering that I was feeling. And, and I decided at that time, kind of along the the idea of the mishmash that um, it would just be very confusing if I was going to study Vedanta and Hinduism and Buddhism and somehow try to practice uh, a spiritual life. And so I, I said, okay, well, I kind of see these things as a framework. And so I'm going to choose one and stick to it. So things are a bit easier for me and I can start to learn. Um, and so I, I chose Buddhism and, you know, mostly what I studied uh, in the beginning, uh, luckily, was like a Hinayana approach. And all the books I read, though, kept saying, like, you can't do this alone. You need a teacher. You need a Sangha. You know, it's one of the triple jewels. And I didn't know where to find those things. And so I kind of started like, okay, well, how do I, how do I find a teacher and what do I do? So I started looking around and, um, you know, this is over the course of a few years. I mean, I was still dealing with a lot and, uh, I found the San Francisco Zen center, which is kind of like the, the Vatican of Zen in America. And it happens to be close, you know, so I started like going out to Green Gulch Farm uh, a few times a year um, to listen to a man named Reb Anderson, and I found that. 
very fruitful and very interesting. And so I continued to look for a teacher. And at that time I was um, beginning a relationship with my daughter's mom, Penny. She is here in the back. That's why I'm doing these hand signals like this. Um, and she wanted me to go to premarital counseling. And I was very resistant at that point in my life. I was like, why would we like mess up a good thing, letting some therapist we don't know into this? And I think it's that's really important because that's like the state of mind I was in, right? Like I was just really rigidly trying to give up those attachments and things were very cut and dry for me. Um, I was beginning a career as an attorney and there was very clear right and wrong. There was very clear power structures to me. I was highly competitive. Um, and so the idea of that open type of discourse was not a positive thing to me. Premarital counseling is really cool. <laughs> Just side note, anybody listening, you get to go over like values and priorities with your partner and like discover where maybe uh, there's problems that you didn't know exist where they lie so that you can like work on them together before you make those commitments and before they actually become a problem. So I would highly recommend it. Um, I was at least open enough at that time to uh, say that I would go to a Buddhist relationships workshop. And that was at Tassajara Zen Center. And so this is a picture of us with two Zen priests, Chris Fortin on the right and her husband, Bruce Fortin on the left. And they led the retreat and we really enjoyed what we learned there and really enjoyed them <laughs> yeah that's me <laughs> in, a, in a different life <laughs> yeah and um so over over the uh we asked them if they would marry us and so there was a they kind of had us do a process with them over the course of a year getting to know them and creating the ceremony and um, so this is on the wedding day and um, so Chris then um, still a few a few months later after she came over for dinner one day and she said you know you're a vet right and I said yeah and she said well I happen to have founded a, a veterans nonprofit with my friend Lee and it would be really cool if you came so if you could do the next picture. And so I did, I went to a one day event. Uh, and so this is a picture that's coming of me and Lee and Chris, it'll happen. Um, but uh, I, I definitely like my primary goal in uh, going toward veterans path was I wanted to be close to Chris. I wanted a Zen teacher. And so I saw this as an avenue to begin to build that relationship and get closer and closer to her to develop my Buddhist practice. Um, I should say too, so during this whole time, that date I mentioned of 2006, when I started studying Buddhism, I started trying to meditate then too. And I can say throughout this period, um, I was really trying very hard to develop a daily meditation practice and a lot of times for long periods of time I was successful at that, but my meditation was marked by intense physical pain. I would, I would just hold myself so tightly that even after short sits I, I would have muscles cramping in my neck and my upper back. It was very, very painful in the internal state. Uh, was like being on fire is, is all I can say. It was just like uh, an onslaught of, of thoughts and um, internal heat. It was very unpleasant, but for some reason I kept doing it. I, I really thought there was something there and um, I could go on and on. I mean, I still had a lot of insights, but I won't bore you with all those. So, but this is, so these are the two founders of Veterans Path. 
um, Lee on the right and Chris on the left. And Lee is um, the person who has taught me sensory awareness practice. And so Veterans Path has given me a lot. Um, what sensory awareness practice did for me was um, it allowed me to start uh, figuring out where I actually was at the time and to begin to see my life and my state for what it was where when I was meditating in those states, I was still trying to be something else instead of accepting the pain that I was in currently and beginning to deal with it. So sensory awareness practice is like just grounding ourselves in the basic senses in the moment. What am I hearing, smelling, seeing, feeling? What is my body temperature? What is the support under me right now? How am I using that support and relating to gravity with that support? And how am I breathing? It's an extremely simple practice. And we would go through these practices and at first, honestly, in, in Veterans Path, you know, I was there to learn Buddhism. I was there and Chris did teach a lot of Buddhist principles, but so I was learning it. Um, but I was really there to learn Buddhism, and then I was going to be the helpful guy, right? Like I was going to help all my other vet friends who had problems out because I was doing so well. I mean, that's being a little flippant towards myself, but it was kind of like that. Um, and I just, I couldn't, even during these sensory awareness practices, I would just find myself just totally checking out. I couldn't pay attention. I would be falling asleep. I was really uncomfortable, and I'd find myself getting annoyed. Like, what is this woman talking about? You know, she would say things like, you know, put and this is the one that really got me and she would say things like put your hand on the back of your neck you know i invite you to because you don't have to do anything right like it's all our own individual choice and so it's all like an invitation like oh you can put your hand on the back of the neck. like what do you what do you feel there you make a feel a neck you know like <laughs> duh you know i'm thinking to myself like what is she getting at you know she's, she's like do you feel anything alive there like, like duh of course you know like i'm alive right and there was there was no depth to my experience of myself right like i was still very much living in a compulsive way i had become an attorney because that's what my parents wanted me to do i wanted to have a very uh you know good materialistic life uh, i wanted power in the community i wanted wealth and I was willing to sacrifice a lot of myself to get those things. And I was in a lot of pain and I was really closed off to the people that cared about me. And so I couldn't, like, I didn't feel much of anything. I was just like, yeah, I'm here, like, what? And uh, it, took, it took several years until that particular prompt I was just talking about. And I had this experience where like I touched the back of my neck and I felt alive. Like I felt my own living being and that I was this creature with all this other life and how special that was, how tender it was to be alive and the depth of it and how connected we were and that this experience of being alive in this this moment truly, truly mattered. And I know, like I can say these words, and if you've had that experience and you know, and, and if you haven't, search for it, because um, it radically shifted my life. Like there was nothing different about the prompts and the practice than any other time, but for some reason, finally I had opened to what it meant to be alive in this moment. And uh, it, it broke me down. And my life started to shift pretty radically after that. Um, doing the sensing practice, really being present, I was able to start seeing like how much of my life I didn't enjoy, that I didn't feel connected to, that I didn't feel authentic in. 
And I made a pretty deep commitment to myself to make whatever changes were necessary and suffer whatever consequences came because of those changes. Um, and uh, I had also um, pretty quickly after getting into veterans path, I think because I had been sitting in meditation and stuff like that, I was invited into a leaders cohort, a three years uh, leaders program. And so if you want to do the next slide, one of the things veterans path does is it, we do outdoor events that draw veterans in, right? Because a lot of vets, if you're like, hey, let's go learn meditation and mindfulness, they're like, mm, that doesn't, that doesn't sound great. So we say, hey, come whitewater river rafting with us, or let's go to a climbing gym and climb, or let's go kayaking for the day on the Russian River. These are some of the things we do. And so for the first half of the day, we do kind of adventure related activities. And then the second half of the day, we teach meditation and mindfulness techniques. And so this was the first year I went, it's 2014, the first year I went on uh, the annual whitewater rafting trip. And that was the first time that I facilitated a, a group discussion uh, and it was on intimacy. Um, and what I found is that the work is, is intensely amazing because it's collaborative and open and uh, so much can be learned and created when everybody is is there and willing to offer themselves to to these moments um, and so i definitely had an idea of what i wanted to get out uh, in that talk but what i found very quickly was the wealth of information of the group and what we built through that talk was extremely eye-opening um, and it was it was a magical experience for me and so i've continued to do that work and it's been uh, really meaningful to me uh, so uh, you know through that too i kind of found myself at summer lama jimpa talks about a lot which is that um, a lot of times before we can really do buddhist practice we need therapy and so it, you know, that process to me that I've been talking about made me realize that um, I likely had, um, and also working with vets so that I could relate to them. And I started finding you know, something about vets with uh, trauma related conditions is a lot of them have like fairly normal lives and then they have a combat experience and then they can see how they're different. So they can very clearly describe how how they related to life what happened and how they relate to life now where for me because of the way i was raised like that was not a clear transition i thought everybody was living uh relating to life the way i did and so in doing this work too i started seeing that i had some pretty serious maladaptive responses and um, so i started also going to therapy and so this is all kind of a, a culmination, uh, I would say, to um, finally meeting Lama Jimpa. And even though I, at that point I had been practicing Zen for almost a decade, I, I consider it was only after meeting him and beginning to work with him that I like truly started to practice Buddhism. Um, and especially meditation. Um, a little bit about, um, oh, that, that's a good one. Um, Lee and Chris. Chris, like you saw, is a, um, an ordained uh, Zen priest, and she is available to work with even in town through Valley Stream Zen Sangha. If you look on their website, if it interests you, she helps facilitate a... Um, Dharma and racial justice group. Um, and she's in Sebastopol. So she's been teaching Zen since 1976. And then uh, Lee is a sensory awareness teacher. So she, when she was 19, met her teacher, whose name is Charlotte Sel. I don't 
I want to make sure I say her name right right now. It's in here somewhere. Charlotte's Charlotte Selver. And Charlotte Selver was like second generation sensory awareness teacher, the woman who created it, Greta, who from the 1800s taught Charlotte. Charlotte immigrated right before World War II. She was a, a German Jew. She made it over here before the Holocaust. And she taught Lee. Lee met her at 19. At uh, 21, she decided to do a 16-week uh, course with Charlotte, who happened to be really good friends with Shinryu Suzuki Roshi, who started the San Francisco Zen Center in Green Gulch. So he said that she could stay at Green Gulch Center while she went through this course. And she ended up staying for um, five and a half years and studying Zen. So two and a half at Green Gulch and three years at Tassajara. So both, both women are um, deeply trained in, in meditation and mindfulness. Um, and I, would say my experience with them was constantly um, coming into contact with somebody who deeply heard what I was saying, even when I wasn't being clear and uh, pointing me to the goodness that was already there in my heart. And uh, through those interactions, I knew that that was um, something I wanted to cultivate in myself to be able to give others. Um, let me just look at my notes. They have since retired, and Veterans Path has changed quite a bit. Um, so now uh, we do meditation instruction online. So I teach cohorts there in a particular style of meditation that was created by um, two men that are Nyingma students and graduated from Naropa in Colorado, if that means anything to you. Um, but it is a shamatha vipassana approach um, leading to Dzogchen practices the, and the beginning part is always um, a nervous system calibration. So we go from nervous system calibration to the great perfection in those teachings and in their method over a six week course, which is like rocket ship. But um, so I teach uh, online with them and then I still uh, facilitate groups. And so this picture was from last summer um, me and three other facilitators uh, took this group of 20 vets down the San Juan River in Utah. And um, so we go down the river and then in the afternoons and evenings we camp, meditate, have facilitated discussions, which is kind of, I think of like um, friend therapy. You know, it's, we kind of bring in topics that we know we're dealing with and that vets deal with that are just humans deal with. Um, so uh, I'm just plugging Veterans Path right now. They are a nonprofit. If you ever want to help vets out, it's very personal work. And like I've related, I mean, I feel like it saved my life. I can't tell you the difference uh, between the experience I had of living before and the experience of living I'm having now and how much richer and more joyful and meaningful that it is and the relationships that I have now, how great they are in comparison. Not always easy, not always going perfect, but uh, it's really nice to be here for them. Uh, so moving on the next picture, this just uh, January, February, I went to Mexico to do a week uh, sensory awareness retreat with Lee. So there we are on a bus trip together during that. And I want to show you just a little bit of like how a sensory, a sensory awareness practice looks because it's a little wacky. So the next picture is us practicing. And if you can kind of see there's people sitting in chairs, there's people laying around. 
And then Lee's the person standing in the background kind of giving prompts. Um, <clears throat> but so the, the basic idea is that if we ground ourselves in the present moment through our senses, we're able to open. Um, and so I hope that there's been kind of this theme in this, in me relating my story so far of the difference between openness and closed. And I'm wearing these dog tags that we got in Veterans Path. And it has a quote from Lee that says, there's nothing my heart can't hold while open. And the idea is that the more we're open and receptive and honest with what's happening for us in the present moment, uh, the more we're able to be with, instead of resisting, judging, pushing away, condemning, or turning away from an indifference. Um, and so a quote from Lee's website, which she learned in, and I think this relates to how she teaches practice in uh, Zen training is, one of the core lessons she learned from her time as a Zen student was that there was really no place to run no escape from being with what is. Lee had spent a lot of energy in her life trying to run away from what was unpleasant, scary, or uncomfortable. After many hours of just sitting meditation, often being uncomfortable, the discovery of how different it was to simply be uncomfortable, following whatever changes came, rather than trying to resist the pain and wait for the bell to ring, was very distinct. All of the extra effort to try to force change or to get away from what was uncomfortable were not effective and caused another layer of pain. Whatever was actually happening was the only thing that could be happening. And no matter how much we might wish for something different, the ease and opening comes from arriving just where we are. Or as Lama Jempa always says, Life can only happen in the present moment. And another quote from Charlotte Selver. Uh, if you have these two things, the willingness to change and the acceptance of everything as it comes, you will have all you need to work with. Uh, so with that, I'd like to transition to a short sensory awareness practice. Um, so to begin, I'll just say everything I'm gonna offer is an invitation. You don't have to do any of it. This is really, I think, a way of um, getting through our natural compulsions that develop over time to be what we think we should be, to avoid the things that we don't like, um, and to begin to shed that and, and meet the present moment in a fresh way so that we can be fully and truly alive. Always focusing on what your senses are experiencing but notice your reaction to them. You know, like I did, I kind of told you, you know, my reaction was a little bit flippant towards it, you know, like what in the hell, right? So this is one of the ways I deal with discomfort, you know, and I got to get in touch with that, that this is this, this theme that's keeping me from accepting what truly is all the time was with that resistance. So this is an opportunity and a very like, quiet singular way um, we do do group interactions too i don't think we will this morning but um to get in touch with uh that experience also in a buddhist way not to mishmash but if you're a uh, uh, hip on the five aggregates i always think that this is kind of like five aggregate practice so Charlotte always said that there's three cosmic forces and she wasn't like a very cosmic type person, I guess. She was very practical, but cosmic forces are, that are always with us are support, gravity, and breathing. So let's just take um, a 
few minutes to breathe and settle in and then I'll give some prompts and if you want to roll with them, you can. So first just notice your breathing. And that you are breathing. And then notice well, what's supporting you. Where's your body touching that support? And what parts of your body aren't supported or aren't in contact with that support? What's the difference in the feeling of the two? Can you notice the, the feeling of your skin that's covered in clothing? And the skin that meets air. How is it to have both those sensations at once? If you feel safe, please close your eyes. Notice if you have any discomfort. Can you allow yourself to, to change into a more supported position? What if there is nothing keeping you right where you were at in the shape you're in and you were allowed to be as comfortable as you needed to be? A second I'll ask you to do something that you've done a million times so I ask that you don't just do it right away don't do it like you've always done it before but wait and engage it with intention and then follow the movement to completion I'm going to ask that you just raise your hand up above your head. So what is it? What muscles are activated? Do you feel your clothing move as you raise your arm? And once it's up, can you find support there? Or does it take a lot of effort?
If it starts to be uncomfortable, can you find a more comfortable position? Can you feel free to explore? Noticing if you get frozen. your reaction to doing something different. And slowly bring your hand down and put it somewhere that you would never think of putting it, touching some part of your body. Can you stay with the movement through the whole process, not just trying to get to the place. Can you feel your clothes move as you move, enjoying the sensations the whole way through, not forcing the outcome? Let's move to another place on your body. And if you feel like relaxing yourself into your position, please do that. And again, I'm gonna ask you to do something that you've done over and over and over again in your life. Let's see if you can meet it fully as if it's the one and only time you will ever do this action in this moment, because it is. I'm going to ask you to stand up. And just feel the process of standing up. Don't try to just get to standing. Whenever you're ready. And when moving calls you. Were you with it, or was it just something you had to do? What is your experience of gravity right now? Can you play with support? What's different about this time you're standing than other times? Keep your eyes closed for another few seconds. I'm going to have you open them. And what is your, I'm going to ask you, what is your experience of seeing, but try to do that without grabbing onto something with your eyes. Can you just open and see everything fresh? And you want to open them and it really calls to you. Can you feel the difference between when you want to open your eyes and when you just open them? Because you're told to. What is seeing without grabbing on to something to see? And 
if you want, put your heart on hand on your heart. What do you feel there? How does your skin feel? Where your hand meets your chest. Go ahead and take a seat in a way that you've never sat down before. Let's just take a couple minutes to be with our breath. Again, finding what's supporting you and how you can allow that support so that you can be here with as little effort as necessary, as relaxed as we can be while being present. Recognizing that the support we need is always available in every moment. We are continually supported. How do we meet that support in relation to gravity? Thank you for letting me share my life with you. It was really sweet. And um, if you do want to help vets, please check out veteranspath.org. And if you're interested in learning more about sensory awareness, uh, please go to, uh, I saw the thing, now I forget it. Um, I'll just look it up and then Chris and her work can be found if you just Google Chris Fortin. She has a couple sanghas in the North Bay. A return to our senses. Returning to our senses. Uh, is 
the organization that he works with. Yes, return to our senses.com. And also, uh, Chris has a, a racial uh, equality and Dharma group that you can access through Valley Stream Zen Sangha, which is here in town. And just, I can't say uh, enough about those two women and how they've helped me open up, changed my life. And I feel like they prepared a soil so that I could work with Lama Jimpa. Uh, we're really blessed to have the teacher we have. Um, and, you know, I think it was probably only through working with these two very enlightened women that I could glimpse Lama Jimpa for uh, the compassion he has and how diligently he works for others in and he makes it look effortless and uh, it's very profound and constantly teaching. Uh, can't say enough. And I really appreciate all of you being here. Uh, the Sangha is real family, really supportive. And thank you. Any, oh, uh, should do questions now, right? And then we do dedication. Are there any questions? Hi, Jules. Hi, Matthew. Um, great talk, as usual. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you could describe more of the connection you have with sensory awareness and shamatha, because like, I'm just, when hearing you speak about this, I'm just remembering how difficult even sitting for six minutes was for me, like four years ago when I started sitting like I would just be so tight like I would just focus on the pain right away and it was just so painfully difficult and you know hearing your difficulty with that too I'm just kind of wondering you know what your process was there and you know how did you grow to the point where you're able to sit for longer periods of time um, I think to, to sit for longer periods of time I had to do incremental and I actually like kind of re like completely started over when I started working with Lama. Like I went from from kind of like what what we're asked to do. I was sitting like 20 minutes a day, but then like when I started working with him and getting very real with myself, I went back to starting with six minutes a day and like slowly worked my way up and then um, have put myself out there to go to different places where there is longer sits to to kind of like lean in and stretch into that and I think that that's important because it can be really like once I notice with me once my concentration goes if I'm doing longer sits like I'm just blown out and that's that's it so after that point it's not super helpful for me to to keep uh trying that day um I think the relationship between sensory awareness and meditation is that grounding myself in the senses allowed me to feel my own aliveness, which means then when I was meditating, I was no longer holding an overly rigid militaristic posture or um, expecting perfection out of myself anymore. So I, I started to be able to, I think, get more intimate with my mind because I stopped expecting to be or desiring to be something else. And uh, being in the present moment connected with the senses in this very simple way um, allowed for that to get out of my, my head and my uh, trying too hard, I guess. <laughs> No, thank you. Dylan? Uh, I have a question with like focused meditation. When you're like so focused on your breath, can that derail you from really pure perceiving because like one of the things that i'm doing right now is uh you know trying to cold plunge daily 
And so the only thing that gets me through that sensation of real cold is just really concentrating on my breath and not really concentrating on how the cold is making my body feel. So is that good or bad? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like, um, I don't want to label any of that like good or bad. Um, I do want to again say sensory awareness practice is not traditional Buddhist meditation. So those things are distinctly separate from distinctly separate schools. And um, I think what it sounds like you're describing and doing the cold plunge is that the intense focus is a distraction from other sensations. And I'm kind of going to toss the ball back to you that um, I'm wondering if uh, with that concentration, eventually you are able to open back up to a broader awareness as your nervous system aligns with those conditions. Or do you just distract it until you can get out? So if I don't, if I don't focus on my breath, it is extremely hard to stay in the cold water. Like I cannot do cold at all. So like, I, I just can't. So if I'm not breathing, yeah, like I'm trying to jump out ASAP. But my breath and just holding my breath and feeling my breath is the only thing that keeps me. Like I, I still feel the sensation a little bit of the cold, like on my chest and stomach a little bit, you know, but I'm just feeling only paying attention to the air coming in and out. That's what I'm mostly focused on. Mm -hmm. So you don't ever feel your nervous system calm back down and, and the pain decrease? I don't think so, no. I think that's where my question was. Should I try to have more focus on the pain and just live with it and try to open? I mean, that sounds like a, probably more like a question for Win, Winhoff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Roberto. Jumping into his question, I think is the question is when when the when paying attention for the sensation is a negative sensation instead of feeling good, like if my hands are really warm now and when I put but then in my leg is a good feeling warming up my leg with my hands. But what if it's the opposite? What if it's a negative sensation and I still try to be present to a negative sensation and learn from that? Or I try to avoid? That's, that's what normally we do, right? We avoid discomfort and look for comfort. So in, in this kind of meditation, you embrace the pain, you, you, you stay there and feel the pain and learn from that, or you avoid the pain and, and try to make yourself comfortable and learn in a different way, learn what makes you comfortable. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just trying to jump into his, <laughs> into his question. One of the things that I have uh, I've found to be really profound about the way Lee teaches sensory awareness is um, it does tend to focus on getting in touch with our own knowing. And that when it comes to our personal experience, we are capable of knowing what's best for us especially if we're like really being open to the present moment and that uh it kind of it kind of reminds me of like what we talk about in vajrayana's vajra pride and that there can be no prescriptive uh set of standards in what we should do in any given circumstances because life is fresh and continually moving and never static. And so 
we just can't. It would be impossible to to create a, a prescriptive way of meeting it and what would be right or wrong in any given circumstance. But that if we're open and meeting it in our honesty and we know whether we're trying to avoid or lean in or maybe push in, maybe that's too much, right? Now we're attaching uh, a little too heavily to something. Like we, we know that. If we're really open to the present moment and then we can, we know how to take care of ourselves. I'm relating this to um, teachings on equanimity. You know, I wonder when, when we're talking about a negative feeling and a positive feeling in sensory terms. Um, that's that's um, not an accurate way of, that's not a realistic, that's not the way things really are. Walking outside in the heat is walking outside in the heat. Walking outside in the cold is walking outside in the cold. And can I experience that one or the other without saying, oh, I prefer this to that. This is negative, this is, this is uncomfortable and this is comfortable. Is that making any sense? You know, so is a sensory experience necessarily bad or good? Is it just a sensory experience? Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? It, it, it does make sense. I mean, I think like we have um, like what what I hear is like this when we start to rub against our own compulsion, meaning, um, you know, I don't. I don't particular. I don't like the cold, right? So now, if I'm experiencing cold, I might be adding all this baggage onto it because I'm I'm in the state that I've already decided I don't like, right? So I'm gonna be like tensing. Oh, my back always gets sore when I'm cold, and you know this is gonna happen later. I'm gonna throw my back out today because I'm walking around in the cold. Like all this extra stuff starts um, when I really label stuff good or bad um it but it takes if I you can, away from the sensory experience right and the present moment at the same time right that's not to say if i'm really cold like i can't go get a jacket or i can't maybe i'm like okay well this is a little too unpleasant for me i'm going to cut the walk short you know like i might make those decisions i don't think that's detracting from the actual experience, you know, of, of being in the cold. Um, so it's, again, it's not a, um, a practice that leads us to a right or wrong way. It's a practice that leads us to the truth of our existence in this moment. Thank you. Thank you. So you and I have a couple of things in common. <laughs> That's right. So um, I recognize that between my upbringing and my experience in the military, that um, I'm very good. And you probably remember this phrase, suck it up. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have been conditioned to tolerate pain and persevere. And so even learning about this type of meditation to me, for me, I ignore pain, I ignore sensations of my body, and I think it's all based on conditioning from when I was younger and in the military, just suck it up, ignore it and move on. Um, I can't imagine 
that in your experience working with veterans that I think, and I, I work with veterans too, several, and I, and I know that they have that same kind of mindset, right? Suck it up, move on, that it must be very difficult for them to move past that. But also when you start paying attention to your body and paying attention to your pain, uh, I, I can't imagine that there's a whole lot that comes out emotionally. Just making that observation. You know, it's, it's definitely true. A lot of the experiences in veterans path um, can be very intense. Um, what people go through on the trips and it's uh, we uh, one of the, the facilitators who goes on longer trips uh, named Vanessa Mead is really great is a, um, a licensed therapist. So me and the other facilitators who aren't licensed, we always like to have her as like, hey, we know somebody like licensed is here and like legally. But I think what's really been amazing to me is like when I've seen so that's encountering themselves and their own tenderness and their their own sanctity of of life in themselves and like a recognition that they matter enough not to always have to push through everything but to stop and to receive care and to receive validation and and to take care of themselves um that the support is always overwhelming and though the support isn't overwhelming i shouldn't say that. the support is there though and the the um, camaraderie i have to say with one thing about vets is they kind of um you know, I think we all think of them in a certain way, but the thing is, since they've been through it, they kind of don't mind being whatever they are in the moment. They're very like, well, I feel like this right now, you know, and they're, they're surprisingly brave at showing uh, vulnerability and tenderness and, and their reality when they're given the space to. And, and so I think, uh, we, you know, we're lucky enough to have this group of people who are going through these really intense things, but then the other people there are like in this really non-judgmental way, like there for them with it and like have a real understanding. And I do think too, like it's, um, that's why it can't, I think, be prescriptive because like for vets, like you're saying, right, there's this like drive hard mentality. So probably in this practice, they're constantly finding like, I'm pushing too hard, right? Like I need to, to soften. I need to, to be open. I have to pull back a little and actually feel some of this, actually admit some of this tenderness, actually care for myself in a different way. With a different group or a person, it might be different. You know, they might find like, I'm really overly concentrated on my difficulties. You know, I'm really overly like every little ping pang negative thing. I feel I'm really focused on it. Like I might need to lean into life a little bit more to really engage it. You know, I'm allowing that to kind of push me out of places I want to be. If that hmm. makes sense, you know, so. Uh, just being here it is the teacher roberto I, I i see different ways to deal with pain and what oh i i thank you i see different ways to deal with pain and one um one is like very very common is try to ignore the pain, but then even if you ignore the pain, the pain is there. So what happened is, oh, what if I have some drinks? What if I have some substance or some drugs? That's something that's gonna make me not feel the pain so so bad, not not suffer so badly, right? So in, and you look around you. You see a lot of people doing that, right? Every day, like, what what can I take now to give me some, to take me away from the pain? But the pain is there, even if you, 
do things like you try to escape, but the pain is still there. So I think the, the one thing about meditation and, and, and practices that you try to be with yourself is that, okay, the pain is here. I am not the pain. I, I'm not going to escape. I'm not going to run away from it because it's part of, of my experience right now. So, but I don't need to get lost or put my identity in the pain that I feel. So the pain that I feel, I, I'm talking about emotional pain. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can sit with my pain, observe my pain, learn from my pain, instead of, uh, instead of running away or trying to escape. So that's very different approach. I want to escape or I want to learn. I think that's, I'm not trying to be right and wrong, but if I look around me, it's a lot of people saying, I need to escape. I need to, I need to escape out, oh, doesn't matter what, I do whatever it takes to escape from the pain. And, and very few people who said, okay, you know, that's, that's what, what is in, the, in my plate today, so. I, I'm gonna deal with that instead of, and, and if it become too difficult, I may I may let it sit on the side and I I deal with that tomorrow again. I, I may break this in parts. If the if the pain is too intense, and I cannot deal with that, like when we are in really uh, heavy pain, sometimes uh, our body shut shut down, mm. so we don't we don't damage our nervous system with the pain, right? So we shut down, they put you to sleep. They make you unconscious. So if being conscious got to a point where you start going to shut down, you said, you put it on the side and you said, okay, I deal with you tomorrow. I, 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 we, we're still in touch, we're gonna, we're gonna deal with this tomorrow if the, the pain is there tomorrow, and also don't get attached to it. Don't think uh, being in pain is a lifestyle. Oh, okay, you're gonna suffer a little more today. No, <laughs> it's more like if there is suffering there, you have to deal with that. Because the, the other option is really not, is not solving any problem, but making the problem bigger and bigger. So it's going to be more difficult. It's it's almost like doing the dishes, you know. You have you do the dishes every day because if you let it sit for one week, <laughs> it's going to be way worse to, to deal with that. So you, right. but you're not in love with that. You're not in love with with the pain. With the, you just you're just working with it, with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's extremely profound. You know, a pain, right, is a signal. I know even like in physical pain, being a body worker, like we have this physical pain for a reason, right? It's it's telling us that we're we're sitting in the wrong posture repeatedly, you know, we're we're doing something that's hurting ourselves. So how how can we how can we learn from that and maybe start changing some of our body dynamics so that there's less pain or like stretch, exercise, whatever that might be. You know, but meeting that pain teaches us where, well, what is this coming from? And I think like what you're saying with emotional pain, um, you know, I think most emotional pain stems from our love for others or self. And so we have all these, these things come up when, when painful thing, when bad things happen to people we care about or to ourselves. And if we, we try to avoid that, then we miss the depth that life has to offer. And I really appreciate what you said about um, like not like understanding where your limit is so that, you know, you can not be shut down by the pain, you know? And I mean, that sounds like a really high level practice of, of meeting the pain of what you're going through but then knowing like, this is good. This is overwhelming me now. I need to do something else. I need to distract myself or something like that. Like, 
I've learned what I can learn today for where you're at. Yeah, it seems like very profound to me. Thank you. Omo araya pazaya na aindi Om araya pazaya na aindi Omo